History holds many mysteries and secrets. There are also many dark pages in history about which history teachers in schools and universities prefer to remain silent, but the facts remain facts even after 1,000 years. Today we will talk about interesting, shocking, and frightening facts that have remained on the pages of history and that you most likely would not have known. And before we start, support my channel with your like and subscription. Also, turn on notifications to catch all the new releases. Get ready to be shocked, we start. In the Middle Ages, the church forbade forks and called them the wiles of the devil. Such a common cutlery for a modern person as a fork has a very ancient and entertaining history. Strangely, such an ordinary object spread around the world for such a long and painful time. For example, in the United States, it became popular only in the 19th century. If you trace the entire history of the fork, you can learn an incredible amount of interesting things about the development of society, religion, and even gender stereotypes. The Catholic Church once recognized this device as blasphemous, effeminate, and even sacrilegious. When forks appeared, such a common thing today was not always so. Most historians believe that forks were invented and used in the early Middle Ages in the 4th to 5th centuries. It could have been much earlier. In Europe, for some reason, this cutlery was associated with oriental decline and considered blasphemous and effeminate. The fork was called an effeminate and blasphemous object. According to some reports, the fork, as personal cutlery, first came to Europe in the 11th century. A Byzantine princess married a Venetian doge. She brought this item with her. She ate with a golden fork so as not to get her fingers dirty. Today it seems normal and logical, but then it was a real scandal. In Catholic society, this caused incredible outrage and was recognized as blasphemy and decadence. The church forbade the use of the fork, arguing that this item is not at all so necessary for life and therefore not Christian. The priests believed that such cutlery was used only by oriental harlots. The device was dubbed the pitchfork of the devil. When a Byzantine princess died of the plague, a Benedictine monk named Peter Damien saw this as just retribution. He said that she was punished for her vanity because to eat, God created hands. This story is attributed to two different Byzantine princesses, Theodora Ducana and Maria Argyropolina. The dates don't match, but the message is clear. The use of forks was not only frowned upon, it was condemned and regarded as a terrible sin. It should be noted here that in the Middle Ages, civilized Europeans ate with their hands, sometimes using a knife, and the tablecloth was used as a huge napkin for general use. The soup was generally eaten from a common plate. The fork only became popular in the post-medieval era. This happened due to the growing popularity of pasta, which was very convenient to eat with a fork. Gradually, this cutlery spread throughout Europe. When Catherine de' Medici married Henry II of France in 1533, she brought with her the custom of using forks. This is how it became fashionable. By the beginning of the 17th century, the fork had changed its shape, received tines, and an additional bend for scooping, and reached England. From there it spread to the American colonies. There, too, a very cold reception awaited her. What absurd things have not been accused of this unfortunate object? It wasn't until the 19th century that the fork came to dominate the table in Western culture. A person is so accustomed to many things that he cannot imagine how people lived before his invention. Napoleon's fight with rabbits. The number of enemies was measured in thousands. They surrounded Napoleon and his retinue and, in the end, brought them to their knees. In desperation, the French emperor retreated. Many will think that we are talking about Waterloo. But in reality, it's not quite like that. Napoleon's most memorable and humiliating defeat came from an army of fluffy rabbits. One of the most bizarre moments in European history occurred in July 1807, after Napoleon signed the Treaty of Tilsit, officially marking the end of the war between the French Empire and Imperial Russia. To celebrate the occasion, 
the emperor offered to hold a rabbit hunt with his entourage and some of the big shots in his army. Being a busy man, Napoleon instructed his chief of staff, Louis Alexander Berthier, to take care of this event. But it was a big mistake. Berthier began to collect rabbits for a big hunt, but it never occurred to him to approach this issue in a modest way. Although different sources give different numbers, it is generally assumed that Berthier acquired about 3,000 rabbits. On the day of the hunt, Berthier's men placed cages with rabbits along the edges of a large field. When Napoleon and his guests arrived, the rabbits were released so that the dignitaries could hunt them in this field after the picnic. But then something strange happened. The rabbits were not afraid of the crowds of people. The animals, like crazy, rushed at Napoleon and other hunters from his retinue. The emperor was not laughing thousands of fluffy animals, which they simply did not have time to shoot, simply walked at him with an unstoppable wave. Initially, the men laughed at the complete absurdity of the whole situation, and who would not, but as all the new animals threw themselves at their feet, it became really scary. The emperor and his people tried in vain to repel the onslaught, beating the rabbits with stones and sticks and shooting at them, but the long-eared ones continued to arrive. Realizing that this was a battle he could not win, Napoleon hurriedly said goodbye to everyone and got into the horse-drawn carriage. But the flow of fluffies continued to arrive. Historian David Chandler described the semi-comic massacre this way, having a finer grasp of Napoleon's strategy than most of his generals, the horde of rabbits split into two wings and flanked Napoleon's party, heading straight for the emperor. The coachmen tried to move the carriage from their seats, but it was all to no avail. Soon a horde of rabbits flooded the short emperor's legs and began to climb up his jacket. Other rabbits jumped into the carriage. The attack ended only when the carriage finally managed to move and Napoleon, in a panic, threw the rabbits out of its windows. Many may wonder why the rabbits attack people. Berthier can be entirely blamed for this. While he may have been well versed in military tactics, the chief of staff had little understanding of animal husbandry. Instead of catching wild hares to hunt, he took the easy route, ordering his men to buy up rabbits raised by farmers in nearby towns. The problem was that, unlike wild hares, which instinctively try to run away, domesticated farm rabbits were not afraid of people. They saw Napoleon and his entourage and assumed that they were going to feed them, just like the farmers who raised them. When the rabbits didn't find the crispy carrots and lettuce, they were visibly upset. Cleopatra was not an Egyptian. If someone asked you to name an Egyptian from ancient history, you would probably first think of Pharaoh Tutankhamun and Cleopatra. For many people, these are two historical figures representing ancient Egypt, gilded, with eyeliner, and walking around their luxurious palaces with their hands at an angle of 90 degrees. But here's the funny thing, one of those two people wasn't an Egyptian. According to the history of Macedonia, Cleopatra was a member of the Ptolemaic dynasty, which descended from one of the generals of Alexander the Great, a man named Ptolemy I. This means that not only was she of Greek origin, but she also spoke Greek and followed Greek customs. The Ptolemies ruled Egypt for 300 years after the people were handed over to Ptolemy I after the death of Alexander in 323 BC. So how did Egypt end up in the hands of a bunch of guys in helmets from another continent? They conquered it, which the ancient Greeks often did when they were bored. The good news is that the Egyptians were mostly loyal to the non-Egyptian pharaoh because they were fed up with the Persians taking them over before the Alexandrian troops arrived. They were quite content that the new conquerors were better than the old ones. In the 1800s, ketchup was sold as a medicine. In today's world, using ketchup to heal itself sounds ridiculous. This was not the case in the 1830s when tomato ketchup took America's healthcare industry by storm. Previously, ketchup was made from mushrooms or fish, and tomatoes were considered poisonous. That was until 1834 when Dr. John Cook Bennett added tomatoes to ketchup and turned the seasoning into the most popular medicine of the 1800s. Start of the ketchup craze. Bennett claimed to have done research on the tomato and found that it could cure several ailments, including diarrhea, 
cholera, jaundice, indigestion, and rheumatism. Bennett encouraged people to boil tomatoes and sauce to benefit from the fruit's medicinal properties. His research was widely reported in all major American newspapers. Alexander Miles, an entrepreneur in the 1830s, stumbled upon Bennett's research on tomatoes. At the time, Miles was selling a patented drug called the American Hygiene Pill. When Bennett and Miles finally connected, the pill was changed to tomato extract. This reinforced the tomato craze that was taking the country by storm. Miles advertised heavily for his tomato extract, which was sold in both liquid and tablet form. Widespread newspaper advertising everywhere, combined with Bennett's research, increased the popularity of tomato extract throughout the country. Stories about people treated with tomato extract became popular in most newspapers. The headlines say, Tomato pills will cure all your diseases. An 1843 Boston cultivator excerpt read, We knew an instance of a very severe case of dyspepsia, of 10 years standing, cured by the use of the tomato. The patient had been unable to get any relief. He could eat no fresh meat, nor boiled vegetables. Reading an account of the virtues of the tomato, he raised some and used them as food in the fall, stewed, and made some in a jelly for winter use. He was cured. How did the passion for ketchup end? As the craze for ketchup and sauces grew, more entrepreneurs jumped on the idea and started making their version of tomato extract tablets and sauces. The ketchup market grew exponentially and quickly turned into a profitable business. At that time, scientists began to expand Bennett's research and become more critical of ketchup claims. As more scientists have explored the medicinal properties of ketchup, medical professionals have been able to dispel claims that have been put forward as nothing more than a hoax. Soon the hype around the healing properties of ketchup subsided. Although the phase of ketchup as a medicine eventually petered out, it lasted for nearly two decades. Bennett's study may have exaggerated the benefits of tomatoes, but from what we know now, his study was not a complete hoax. Modern research has shown that tomatoes are a major source of the antioxidant lycopene, which has many health benefits, including a reduced risk of heart disease and cancer. They are also a good source of vitamin C, potassium, folic acid, and vitamin K. This tells us that although exaggerated, Bennett's research was not entirely wrong. Ultimately, the ketchup craze did the trick as it dispelled the belief that tomatoes were poisonous. Bennett managed to get more Americans to eat tomatoes, which is never a bad thing. Imagine a world without tomatoes, ketchup, tomato soup, and tomato paste dishes that would be a real disaster. In Europe, women were forced to wear muzzles. In popular culture, the image of an enlightened Europe is directly related to the protection of women's rights. It is believed that in Western countries, fair sex has long enjoyed the same social and civil privileges as men. This statement is more or less true if we talk about the last century. And in previous centuries, muzzles were put on European women, which was done legally. Instrument of torture. In the expositions of many museums in Great Britain, Germany, France, Austria, Spain, and other countries, you can see what the British call Skull's Bridle. We are talking about an iron muzzle that was worn on the head of the fair sex. Another name for this instrument of torture is the Mask of Shame. A female muzzle for a European woman condemned by the Holy Inquisition was put on by the executioner. The metal structure was rigidly attached to the head, it was impossible to remove it on your own. In such a mask, the unfortunate woman could not speak. Often the instrument of torture was supplied with a special iron gag, which seriously injured the woman's tongue and lips with any attempt to say something. This terrible picture was complemented by a bell located on the top of the mask. It served to attract the attention of passers-by. From the 16th to the 20th century, According to Holy Inquisition documents, the Scold's Bridle was invented in Britain around 1500. This instrument of torture has been used in almost all countries of Western Europe since the 16th century. 
It is noteworthy that women's muzzles were used in England until 1901, although the activities of church tribunals that fought heresy and dissent were virtually universally terminated in the 18th century. For example, in the court documents of the British County of Lancashire, the fact of the sentencing of a group of women accused of disturbing the peace in 1856 is officially recorded. They had to wear masks of shame. Usually, such a punishment lasted one day. His goal was not to cause physical harm to the health of a woman. The inquisitors sought to scare the women well to achieve complete obedience from them. The humiliating female muzzle was a means of moral pressure. It is no coincidence that edifying inscriptions were often made on such instruments of torture. For example, who does not want to become a laughingstock must be submissive or a woman must be silent in church. Very rarely masks of shame were worn by men. They were usually subjected to public humiliation as punishment for drunkenness or debauchery. Loquacity and Curiosity Initially, the female muzzle was created to punish talkative and grumpy women to make them shut up in the truest sense of the word. Then the list of acts reprehensible for a respectable Christian woman was filled up with manifestations of inappropriate curiosity. And although a keen interest in what is happening in the world or on the nearest street is not in itself a sin, this personal quality was condemned in women. However, European women also wore a mask of shame and were accused of fraud, rudeness, scandalousness, blasphemy, slander, or foul language. Sometimes, after a public flogging, a woman was forced to stand in a muzzle for another day as a warning to others. Often passers-by threw stones at the unfortunate woman and insulted her, taking advantage of complete impunity for such actions. The zeal of respectable citizens seeking to severely punish the condemned woman was approved by the Holy Inquisition. People could overdo it. However, for the death of the disgraced, no one bore any responsibility. Especially often such public punishments were used in Germany in the 17th to 18th centuries. That is, after the Reformation. Women was punished for domestic misconduct that was contrary to the ethics of Protestantism. This is adultery, debt not paid on time, the lack of proper care for children, and inappropriate behavior in the church. Sometimes the cause of general censure was the defiant clothing of a woman or her vulgar, according to the majority, behavior. Lifetime shame. The inhabitants of Western Europe came up with many instruments of torture and humiliating punishments. This is standing at the pillory and wearing stocks and women's muzzles. In addition to trauma to the lips and tongue, this sentence promised the woman a lot of moral suffering because all relatives, neighbors, and acquaintances remembered the fact of her punishment throughout her life. And given that Europeans usually communicated only with a small circle of people united around the church, for any representative of the women, a muzzle meant eternal shame. Humiliating masks could be different. Often they resembled the features of animals. A curious woman was put on a metal structure with a long beak, a brawler with a donkey's tongue. And on the heads of men convicted of drunkenness, the executioners of the Inquisition hoisted masks in the form of pig snouts. Sometimes a lady sentenced to wearing a muzzle was taken through the streets of the city so that all the inhabitants could see her shame. This was considered a heavier punishment. In such cases, a leash was tied to the mask of shame, by which her husband was supposed to lead the unfortunate. Usually, such a punishment followed for adultery. It was supposed to instill fear in the hearts of women. Learning about such stories, one rejoices that one lives in the 21st century. That's all for today, my dear friends. Mr. Top F was with you. Thanks for watching this video to the end. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications. Also, write down in the comments what topic of the video you want to see in the next release of Top F. Bye.